for the Bible said that he that cometh to God must come believing that he is and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Hello everyone, my name is Ashriel King and tonight I just wanted to touch on again this thing of it being a bad thing right some Christians say it's a bad thing to tell people to repent of sins when in the Bible repenting of sins may not be found there as a phrase in and of itself but the doctrine is there right to turn away from evil to turn away from sin right to repent of wickedness <clears throat> Right, hate, hate that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. That's over and over a concept in the Bible. But some people seem to have a resistance to repenting of sins, obviously. I would say that is because they're holding on to certain sins themselves which they don't want to get rid of. That's all it is. Right, they may find it a bit too difficult, uncomfortable. But the reality, the reality is God loves and when you as a Christian repent of sins, right? He sees that as a good thing, right? God's not going to bewail you and punish you for that. So just think about it this way. Repentance in the Bible isn't always, it doesn't always mean to repent of sin, right? Obviously we know this repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the gospel repentance from real life, re repentance from trusting in your own self-righteousness right repentance from that towards God right then come into faith in Jesus that's one event right two things one event but it's part of the same thing right there right? it's not just believe on Jesus it's repent towards God and come to faith so it's not necessarily turning from unbelief to belief right that's what a lot of people say repentance is Right? I'm just turning from unbelief to belief. But the Bible says repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's belief and repentance is two different things right there. But there's times in the Bible as well, we're going to go to the scriptures in a minute, where God says to turn away from evil, right? Repent meaning to turn away from. Right? God himself has even turned away from evil that he's thought to do upon people. That doesn't mean that God is a sinner. Obviously, you just, you just have to define content. You just have to define repent in the Bible in the context that is given. But 100% repenting of sins as a Christian, and you know what sins are in your life. I don't have to try and name and shame you. Right, you know what sins are in your life. You have to repent of those sins which are holding you back from walking with God. Right, you as a Christian, God indwells with you. Right, he's, in, he's indwelling, he's living within you as a Christian. But you can get out of fellowship with God very, very quickly. By sinning. So obviously you want to turn away from that. Let's go to the scriptures anyway. We'll go to Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24. Right, this is a story of the Apostle Paul encountering a sorcerer. Verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries, but when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptised, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, 
and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon, and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So you see there in verse 22, Simon Peter tells this former sorcerer to repent of his wickedness. Repent of sin, basically. Wickedness is sin, is it not? There you see it. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. This man hadn't even received the Holy Ghost yet. He wasn't saved. He was told to repent of his wickedness. Now we'll go to Acts chapter 24, verses 24 through 25. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and him concerning the faith in Christ, and heard him concerning the faith in Christ, excuse me. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have a more, excuse me, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now again, this is another lost man who the Apostle Paul is preaching to. And look what he preaches. Verse 25, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. So, the Apostle Paul was preaching righteousness to a lost man. Right, some people say, what's the point preaching to lost people that they need to repent of sins? This is, it says it right there, the Apostle Paul did it. Repenting of sins is a good thing. Right? Because even if lost people do repent of certain sins, they can come to the faith of Jesus Christ as a result. Right? I'm not talking about getting them to try and clean up their life, then come to Christ. Obviously not. Because it's repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. However, they need to understand that they will have to turn from certain sins. And certain lost people know that anyway, which is why they remain lost. They don't want to turn from certain sins. So they would rather stay outside of the body of Christ. Right, lost people know this. Right, it's not just repentance towards God, blah, blah, blah. No, no repentance from sin at all. Of course there's repentance from sin when you're a Christian. Of course there is. Let's jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if... Any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. See that key indicator there, that key indicating word, if any man be in Christ. He is, is a new creature. He is, right? It's not a case of he might be a new creature. He may be. He is a new creature. New creature. Right? You need, to put up, you need to put away the old man if you're a Christian. There's going to be repentance from sins. It's that simple. So now we'll go to the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 3 verses 18 through 20. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness, and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Now, of course, this is not for us today as Christians. Right? We don't die or have our souls... Right? Our, our life isn't 
taken away because we didn't warn a certain wicked person. This isn't this isn't a commandment for us today. To make sure that we literally preach the gospel to every single lost individual who walks past us. Right, that's not what that is saying. Because if it was to take that literally for us today, that's what we would have to do. Right? Every single lost person, we would literally have to tell them, look, if you don't come to Jesus Christ right now, you're gonna you're gonna perish. Because according to this right, but according to this passage, if we didn't follow that, and it was for us today, it says it right there. But his blood will I require at thine hand, because we didn't warn the wicked of their wicked way. However, just because it's not for us today doctrinally, doesn't mean there is an instruction in righteousness for us today in this passage. Because there is. Because when you think about it, if you don't warn somebody of the impending doom that they face from not accepting the gospel, they will die and they will burn in hell. That's what will happen. And obviously lost people are wicked at the heart. So of course we're going to want to warn them of their wickedness and tell them what could happen if they didn't repent. But I repeat, not every single person, like not every single lost person, not every single non-Christian, do we have to warn about Christ as a Christian. I don't believe God requires that of a Christian. Right, there's certain times in the Bible where the Holy Spirit forbids Christians to preach the gospel. So, I can imagine it's the same for certain Christians here. When you have an, when you have an inkling, when you have a push from the Holy Ghost, and you'll have that conviction as a Christian, who to preach to and who not to preach to, you'll you'll just know. There's certain people who you just need to leave alone. Right, certain lost people who God just is not dealing with right now so you don't have to pressure yourself to go out and just literally tell every single individual who you don't who's not a christian about about christ i don't believe god requires that of every single christian however when you do feel that push from the holy ghost to witness to an individual you better witness because the consequences of obviously rejecting christ is it's the most terrible consequences you can ever 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 think about in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 13, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep the commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Again, this is a commandment for the Jews. Right, We're not required to keep the laws and the statutes of the old Mosaic Levitical law as christians that's not what we're, we're that's not what we are required to do however turning from evil ways is a very very good thing it's a very very good thing right for lost people and saved people but especially for saved people lost people obviously it doesn't matter as much as it would for a christian because in god's eyes without christ's righteousness right without christ's imputed righteousness upon you which which is what makes you a christian your own righteousness is as filthy rags so a lost person turning from sin yeah that's good but if the lost person doesn't come to christ if they try and work their way to heaven they'll only end up working their way to hell right obviously a lost person today in this dispensation would turn to christ and allow christ to clean up their life for them right that's the gospel Again, I'll repeat, it's not about cleaning up, cleaning up your life first and then coming to Christ because you may never come to Christ if you think you can get there but on your own good works. It's about coming to Christ and then cleaning yourself up. However, there is going to be some cleaning up. That's why this false gospel of zero repentance from sin in the life of a Christian is just nonsense. It's just nonsense. A Christian naturally will want to repent of sin, whatever sins they may be committing or have previously committed when they were lost. Yeah, they may struggle with some of them, but to say that a Christian shouldn't repent from sins, then that's just false. Again, I'll reiterate that lost people do need to come to Christ first before they start repenting of said sins. 
But that's the, that's, the, that's the thing, people. Lost people will do. If somebody is truly lost and sick of the lifestyle that they're leading and they're living, and they hear the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and they, and they believe it, right? Once they accept it, right, and they ask the Lord to forgive them and save them, they will naturally want to turn from that wickedness that they're doing. Like before I actually got saved, I started to get rid of certain sins in my life for about a month or two before I actually asked God to forgive, like before I actually asked God to save me. I was being convicted of certain sins and realizing, yo, I need to stop this, man. I need to, I need to stop this. This is not good. And eventually I got broken down to the point where I, I cried out to God and I asked him for salvation and I received it. But before that, I was already making the waves, right, turning from certain sins. And then eventually I got saved and I started to really clean my life up. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 5 through 10, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I, that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So you see it twice here. Repentance in this passage is a reference to turning from now, just because God repents doesn't mean that God is a sinner. Now, you'll never see in the Bible God repenting of wickedness or sin. So, repenting from evil and wickedness includes man, but repenting from evil only includes God. Right, God can repent from evil and good, but there's a difference between the evil of man and the evil of God. Right, when, it, when you see evil concerning God, if God is doing evil, it's always justified. Right, A lot of people have this misconception that evil is always a terrible thing and it should never be done no evil when it's when it's rained down by god upon a nation upon the world is always justified god wouldn't rain down evil upon anybody if it wasn't justified which is why he can repent of that evil for example natural disasters it's all evil evil just means anything that's destructive harmful Right? But then you have moral evil, which is only committed by man. Right? Murder, rape, torture, these kinds of things. Man can commit moral evil. For example, again, natural evil, stuff like HIV, AIDS, chlamydia, you know, all sorts of sexually transmitted diseases, cancer, that's natural evil. But that, those kinds of natural evil, those kinds of natural evils can be a result of moral evils, for example. HIV, AIDS, can be a result, and generally is a result, of homosexuality. Men with men. And the Bible talks about this. In Romans chapter 1, verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men work in that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, right? It was justified, basically. Because it's, you're going against nature when you do stuff like that, and it has consequences. Sin is negative, and it has terrible consequences. The more you do it, the more danger and the more risk you have of receiving natural evil. Right? God doesn't even have to do anything. For example, somebody who gets drunk. If you're a frequent drunkard, you're going to you're going to ruin your liver. It's only a natural process. You're going to ruin your liver. Like I was at work the other day, I was talking to this one woman who said she suffered a stroke because she was smoking so much. That's what the doctors told her. She was smoking so many cigarettes. She actually had a stroke. Right? A natural evil, the stroke, as a result of the moral evil, which is the smoking. Right? 
The smoke led to the stroke. And yes, smoking is a sin because you're ruining your body and that's the body that God gave you. Right, it's not yours to just do what you want with. I know a lot of people live by the false gospel of do what thou wilt, but the realization, the reality is God owns everything on this planet. God owns everything on the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the Bible says. Right, Everything in it. Lost and saved. Lost and saved people both belong to God. It's not just saved people, although we are bought with a special price, obviously, as Christians. But God still does have ownership over lost people. But he allows them to do what they want. Right, lost people can just sin as much as they want, enjoy it as much as they can. God's not going to force them to come to him or force them to love him or anything like that. They can do what they want, as long as they pay for it in the end. And how do you pay for your sins and your lifestyle of sin? Because after, after death, the Bible says, after death it is appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. So how do you pay for a lifetime of sin? You pay for it with an eternity in the lake of fire. Now, a lot of people might be like, oh, that's not fair. Well, the thing is, the thing is, your sin is forever in front of God's face. And if your sin is forever in front of God's face, you can only pay for it forever. Now, he obviously gave you the opportunity to clear them out, right? God says, okay, you, you're doing that sin. You're committing no sins there. But I don't want you to burn. I don't want you to burn in hell. I don't want you to go to the lake of fire. Let me pay for your sins. Come, come and join me in heaven for eternity. A place with no more peace. Excuse me. No more suffering. No more sorrow. No more pain. Just pure peace. Joy. Pleasure. Happiness. Yet people just say, no, no. I want my lifestyle of sin. Leave me alone. Let me do what I want, God. Let me do what I want. I hate you. So God's like, all right, okay. Do what you want. Let the sin destroy your body. Because that's what it does. There's pleasures in sin for a season, but eventually you're going to reap corruption on your flesh and you're going to die. You're going to shorten your life with your sin. And then you'll die and go to hell. Right? Whereas God's saying, let me pay for your sins. Let me pay for them. People are like, no, no, that's all right, God. I'll, I'll, I'll pay for it myself. It's all good. Just let me do what I want for now. Okay. Your free will. I'm not going to take that away from you. But yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because some people say, oh, yeah, God repented more in the Bible than anybody else. And that's true. But you got to see what the term repentance is in the Bible and contextualize it. Repenting of this thy wickedness, that's a command to repent of sin, right? God isn't wicked in nature, he is holy. So he can't repent of wickedness. However, he can repent of evil, right? There's a difference. God creates evil in the world. The Bible says this, but he also creates peace. He maketh alive and he wounds. He kills, he heals. Right, God may see a Christian and the Christian may be doing something terribly wrong. He may be sinning. Now, God may have had a blessing for that Christian in mind, but because of the Christian's sin, and maybe the Christian's not willing to let go of it, maybe they're just holding on to it, God's not going to bless that person. He may have thought to do good, but he's going to repent of the good which he had thought to do on that person, which, bene which would have benefited them. Right, again, you saw that in Jeremiah chapter 18. Now, we'll go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Chapter 9, verses 20 through 21. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now you see, when people say repenting of sins isn't in the Bible, they're very misleading when they say that because look what you have right here. Right, This is a time period, a future time period coming up where God is raining down his judgment upon the lost world. These are lost men. Right, These are lost men with free will who have the opportunity to turn from sins, but they don't. Right, Let's read the verse... Let's read the verses again. 
and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, that's a sin, and idols of gold, right? Idolatry is a sin, and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, sin, nor of their sorceries, it's a sin, nor of their fornication, right? It's a sin. We're told to flee fornication, nor of their thefts. That's a sin. Repenting from sin is biblical. Standard. Right? There's many more verses which you can go to, obviously, but I just wanted to touch on that today. Don't let anybody tell you, if you're a Christian, that you shouldn't repent of sins. That you shouldn't at least try to live a more pleasing lifestyle in God's sight. Like, the Christian walk is a lifelong walk of repentance, I believe. We're never going to be flawless in our walk, obviously. But the Bible says that we can be perfect. Right, and I use the terms flawless and perfect differently there because there's a difference. When I say flawless, I don't mean that it's going to be... It's going to be cases where there's Christians out there who never, ever sin, ever, ever, ever again. I don't believe that. However, we can reach perfection in God's sight because the Bible says we can. In 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Right? It says right there we can be perfect. And a lot of the new versions take out that word, perfect. A lot of them change it. Like, let's look at the NIV, what it says about verse 17. So that the servant of God may be truly equipped for every good work. The New Living Translation says, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Just cancels out perfection altogether. But oh well, let's see what the ESV says. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Complete. Hmm. The Berean Study Bible says, so that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. New American Standard Bible says, so that the man of God may be adequate. <laughs> adequate, you know, equipped for every good work. And I'm not going to go through every single perversion of the Bible that I can see here, but you get the gist. The new versions take out the word perfect. Because they don't want people to believe that perfection as a Christian is possible. It says the man of God may be perfect, right? Maybe. Not necessarily will be, but maybe. It's possible. And you just have to define what perfect means in this passage. Again, it doesn't mean flawless, sinlessly flawless. I don't believe that. Otherwise, it would have said so. There's a difference. Sinless perfection is not going to be attainable for you down here as a Christian. First and foremost, it's already been attained through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the only one to have lived a sinless, sinlessly perfect life. However, we can be perfect. That's what the Bible is given to us for. God bless. Come on, everybody. Let's call Jesus. Jesus.